Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the immigration of Jews to New York City. Jews have been a part of the city's history since the 1600s. As discussed in episode 1, Peter Stuyvesant attempted to deport them but was stopped by the Dutch West India Company, who said as long as people, meaning white men, make money for the colony, we're all good. Like these first Jews, the Jewish population in colonial New York City, meaning before U.S. independence from Great Britain, was mostly coming from the Spanish and Portuguese empires to escape the Inquisition, which offered Jews the option between death, exile, and conversion. Colonial Jews in New York City were mostly well-off merchants who often mixed with the Christian elite, although had sort of their own separate community as well. Uh, by 1700, there were around 5,000 people living in New York City. Only about 250 of them were Jewish. America's first synagogue, however, was constructed in New York in 1730. By the time of the Revolutionary War, there were likely less than 3,000 Jews living in what would become the United States. Over 100 Jews served in a conflict against Britain, and they had incentive to do so. Unlike Native Americans or enslaved peoples, Jewish immigrants benefited from the revolution in two ways. One, the Constitution protected their freedom of religion. George Washington declared to a Jewish community that they were equal citizens under the new government. Secondly, because they were considered white, Jewish immigrants could become naturalized citizens due to the... 1790 Naturalization Act. It's not like Jews were loved everywhere in their new country. Many states curbed the rights of Jewish citizens. However, overall, the Jewish population benefited from the conflict that freed the United States from Great Britain. Jews from mostly German-speaking regions in Central Europe began immigrating to the United States in the 1820s to escape both persecution and poverty. Many revolutionary Jews in Western and Central Europe, along with revolutionary non-Jews, fled for the United States after the revolutions of 1848 failed. These waves of, quote, German Jews, now Germany wasn't a country until the 1870s, but they were mostly coming from German-speaking regions of Europe. So these German Jews often became traveling goods salesmen or peddlers in the United States. And they came at a time when the United States was expanding westward. And they expanded west with other immigrants and U.S. citizens to sell supplies to farmers and settlers throughout the country. Many of these German Jews stopped and started stores all over the United States. And so when the Civil War came in the 1860s, their loyalties were divided based on the regions in which they were living. About 7,000 Jews would end up fighting for the North, while about 3,000 for the South. But interestingly, Jews throughout these divided United States were assimilated enough in their local communities to be willing to die for national causes they felt connected to. And no big deal, according to Ancestry.com and my dad. My great-great-grandfather, who was Jewish, fought for the North as well. And it's not like they were serving as just cannon fodder. They often were leaders in this conflict. The Secretary of War for the Confederacy was Jewish. That great-great-grandfather I was telling you about was a colonel. This is not to say that Jews during the Civil War weren't often viewed with suspicion. They were on both sides, including by General Grant, who, if it wasn't for the intervention of Abraham Lincoln, would have expelled Jews from parts of Kentucky, Mississippi, and Tennessee. However, these early Iberian and German Jews, who together represented the bulk of the 300,000 Jews living in the United States in 1880, were often fairly assimilated into U.S. culture and largely accepted by their fellow Americans. The Jewish wave that would come after found a very different reception. Between 1881 and 1924, 2.5 million Eastern European Jews, mostly coming from what was then the Russian Empire, immigrated to the United States. So even before this wave of immigration, to be poor in the Russian Empire, particularly to be poor and Jewish in the Russian Empire, was pretty terrible. Jews were often accused of not becoming Russian enough. Children were separated from their parents and taken to be re-educated so that they would be more Russian. But this isn't a unique thing. Uh, marginalized groups are often taken to be re-educated 
This happened to Native Americans into the 20th century in the United States who were taken from their families as children so that they would become more like the white majority around them. So things are pretty terrible for the Jews in the Russian Empire until the reign of Alexander II and things seem to be getting a little better. And then Alexander II gets assassinated in 1881. He gets assassinated because a lot of people were suffering in the Russian Empire. But to kind of get things under control, his successor needed somebody to blame, and he chose to blame the Jews, who were a useful scapegoat because they were a religious and ethnic minority. The year after Alexander II's death, his son, Alexander III, passed the May Laws, which officially blamed the Jews for killing the Tsar. Official state policy began to punish Jews with the aim of eradicating the population from the Russian Empire. A Russian government minister of the time stated his hope that one-third of the Jews will die out, one-third will leave the country, and one-third will be completely dissolved into the surrounding population. Pogroms began being enacted against the Jewish population. A pogrom is when a group of non-Jews would march into the Jewish part of town, beat up Jews, rape Jewish women, and murder a bunch of them before burning down Jewish homes and businesses. This sort of violence was encouraged by an anti-Semitic propaganda campaign organized with the help of the Russian state and the Russian Orthodox Church. One famous pogrom in Kishinev left 49 Jews dead and was led by a Russian Orthodox priest who marched his congregation against the Jews following Easter Sunday services. An anti-Semitic newspaper had insinuated that they thought the Jews had killed two Christian children for their blood to celebrate Passover. News of these pogroms got out of Russia, and in the United States, many U.S. Jews began to fund Russian Jews to come to the United States to escape this sort of violence. There were also economic reasons for Jews to immigrate from the Russian Empire. Both before and after the death of the Tsar, there were laws which prevented them from integrating into Russian society. There were laws against Jews owning land. There was laws against Jews having free movement outside of a designated area within the Russian Empire. There were laws against Jews working certain jobs or getting certain levels of education. In response to this, Jews often became merchants, tradesmen, and tailors, or in the case of my great-grandfather, a deliverer of salt and ice. Further, many Jews left because they wanted to escape military service. All men over 20 were eligible to be drafted, and if they were drafted, they would be stuck in the army for six years of active service and another nine years of reserve duty. Imagine being 20 and somebody being like, your life is on hold until you're 35. Many of those Jews who were in Russia during the start of World War I sought to gain credibility with the Russian Empire by signing up, only to be blamed for early defeats against the Russians. Jews like the Japanese in the United States during World War II and some Italians were often relocated because they were seen as untrustworthy. This experience led many more Jews to flee for the United States. So just to quickly recap, these Jews who were leaving the Russian Empire between 1880 and 1924 were escaping state-sponsored terrorism against Jewish communities. They were escaping economic discrimination and they were escaping war. Also, there were these rumors of a land of freedom and equality where you wouldn't be discriminated against for being Jewish. This led about 2.5 million Jews to leave Russia by the end of World War I, most of them coming to the United States. Similar to the Italians talked about in the last episode, the journey to the United States was daunting. First, they had to get from Russia to the great port cities of Western and Central Europe. Then they got on boats, some of which had been used to transport cattle previously, and they traveled in steerage, below deck, without fresh air. Those immigrants that arrived after 1886 got to see the Statue of Liberty as they had pulled into New York Harbor, and those that arrived after 1903 got to see the Statue of Liberty marked with the words of the famous Jewish-American poet Emma Lazarus. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, the tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The country and city that these Jewish immigrants would be entering was far less accepting of them than her poem suggested. While the Jews arriving into the United States ended up all over the country, most stayed in New York City, 
with the vast majority moving, initially at least, to the Lower East Side. Because of the nature of their flight from the homeland, it was whole families coming together. Further, because of what they were leaving, these Jews did not plan on returning back to the Russian Empire. They initially moved into tenements, which were poor and crowded housing. Bathrooms were often shared between apartments with two per floor, and you needed to get a number to use it. Sweatshops were often located within tenement buildings, where child labor was widespread. The Jews arrived at a time where ethnic immigrant neighborhoods were popping up all over New York City. And this did give Jews a sense of familiarity in their transition to American life. People from a single town in the Russian Empire would go to live in a single tenement building. Further in the Lower East Side, there were Yiddish newspapers, Yiddish theaters, Jewish restaurants, and other institutions that made Jews feel at home. While not to the degree that they were discriminated against in Europe, or to the degree that African Americans or other ethnic minorities faced in the United States, there was a great deal of hostility towards the arrival of Jews from Eastern Europe. Tell me if this sounds familiar. The newest immigrant group was viewed by whites as both competition and criminal. The New York Sun in 1895 wrote, The hatred with which they are regarded, talking about the Jews, ought to be a warning to them. The people of this country won't be starved and driven to the wall by Jews who are guilty of all crimes, tricks, and wiles that have hitherto been unknown and unthought of by civilized humanity. Prominent figures like Henry Ford, the founder of Ford Motors, distributed Russia propaganda against the Jews in the United States. People internalized stereotypes about the Jews as they were banned from many hotels, country clubs, Jobs and ads or signs read, Christians only, or no Jews, no dogs. The Germans and Sephardic Jews who were here earlier looked at these new arrivals and saw them as uncivilized. They didn't want their children marrying these Eastern European Jews. In fact, a funeral was given to my great-grandmother, even though she was still alive because her family was so upset that as a German Jew she had married a Jew from the East. There was a desire by wealthy Jews who had been in the United States for some time to help assimilate these new Jews because there was a fear that the reputation of all Jews would be hurt by these unassimilated new arrivals. Lillian Wald, a German Jew who was financed by other German Jews, founded the Henry Street Settlement, which was a cultural and educational center that helped newly arrived Jews from the Russian Empire integrate into U.S. society. Both of my paternal great-grandfathers were in the Henry Street Settlement learning English in an English class at the same time. These cultural centers served as aid societies to newly arriving immigrants. Much of the lives of these Jewish immigrants from the Russian Empire were shaped by Jews who had been here previously. Jews, for the most part, owned the tenement buildings, where many of these newly arrived Jewish immigrants lived and worked. Also, it was a wave of earlier Jews that ran most of the garment industry. The garment industry was central to the existence of Jews in New York City during this time period. The invention of a new sewing machine enabled the mass production of clothing, and overwhelmingly it was Jewish workers who worked in this industry. 75% of the garment workers were Jewish, and over 90% of the garment factories downtown were owned by Jews. Perhaps 60% of the Jews living in New York City worked in the garment industry at the turn of the century. They worked long hours, perhaps 11 to 15 every day, often seven days a week. This was an industry that was highly dependent on female workers as well. A tradition of unmarried Jewish women working to provide money for their families developed in the old country and continued in the United States. Jewish families in the Russian Empire would often send a daughter to go to the United States to earn enough money for the rest of the family to follow her. They did this in large part because these women knew how to sew. 47% of factories in New York City related to the garment industry by 1910. Oh my god, that's, that's Nigel Hayes. Many of these young Jewish women wanted to be paid their true value and watched as Jewish factory owners would leave the work and go uptown to their mansions as they had to return to their unsanitary settlements in the Lower East Side. Many hated these conditions and turned to radical politics. They came to the United States to be treated fairly and what did they get? Starvation wages, not more than $2 a day, unsafe working conditions, crazy long hours, women garment workers organized for safety regulations in the workplace, higher wages and shorter hours. They were hoping for a 56-hour work week, 
56 hours. They wanted overtime pay and they wanted the ability to unionize. The women workers wanted to strike for better conditions, but the mostly male leadership urged caution. At a meeting in 1910, I mean 1909, I just wanted to show you Nigel Hayes one more time. Clara Lemlich stepped up to the podium and said in Yiddish, I am tired of listening to speakers who talk in generalities. What we are here for is to decide whether or not to strike. I offer a resolution that a general strike be declared now. Her words were quickly translated into Italian and English, and the place exploded with excitement. Nigel Hayes definitely would have supported this strike. About 20,000 garment workers went on strike in 1909. Now, the owners weren't going to just take this. They bought scabs or people to replace these workers. They hired prostitutes to pick fights with workers on the picket line. They paid off cops and paid people to beat up women protesters. The strikers used this all to their advantage, however, knowing that the images and depictions would cause outrage. While many people ignored the strike at first, the wives and daughters of the nation's elite joined them on the picket line and things began to change. Cops acted differently around rich women than they did around poor women. Eventually, many of the factories folded and gave in to the demands for increased safety, increased benefits, and the allowance of union organization. One of the city's largest garment factories was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Unlike many of their competitors, they did not give in to the women's demands. Women returned to work in the 10-story building near Washington Square Park. It was a Saturday in March when a cigarette on the eighth floor of the building set a pile of fabric on fire. The eighth floor operator called up to the tenth floor where the executives were so that the owners could get out of the building through the roof. However, nobody alerted the women on the ninth floor. As the fire continued, the FDNY arrived, but their ladders only went up to the sixth floor. Women pushed for the elevators, which eventually broke down. The fire escapes gave way and numerous people hurtled to their death. Girls jumped together from the ninth floor before being killed with the impact to escape the blaze. Overall, 146 workers were dead. Almost all of these were young Jewish women, although some Italian women were there as well. The youngest was only 14 years old. The owners of the factory were tried for manslaughter because their decisions cost scores of women their lives. The factory locked its doors during the day to keep union organizers out and to prevent the girls from stealing. The owners had the opportunity to install water sprinklers but had declined, likely to save money and because it wasn't required by law. Unsurprisingly, in a nation where wealth often prevails, the owners were acquitted. Poor Jewish workers living on the Lower East Side realized this wasn't the Russian Empire oppressing them anymore. This was greed and the pursuit of capital that had cost these young women their lives. This event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe, as many Jews assumed it was their immigrant girls who had died. Elizabeth Hasanovitz, who was living in the Russian Empire at the time, recalls, I still remember what a panic that news caused in our town when it first came. Many a family had their young daughters in all parts of the U.S. who worked in shops. And as most of these old parents had an idea of America as one big town, each one of them was almost sure that, that their daughter was a victim of that terrible catastrophe. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory also led to major workplace safety reforms. Through their involvement in unions and government, Jews would have a noted role in passing major workplace safety regulation and compensation laws in the years to come. Like we talked about with the Italian anarchists last episode, Many Jews, like Emma Goldman, became increasingly radical after the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory and began to see the United States government as far more interested in protecting capital than in human lives and dignity. A small but influential minority of Jews turned to crime. Jewish gangs and gangsters like Italians, Irish, and Chinese saw an opportunity to get out of the slums fast through a life of crime. Meyer Lansky became one of the heads of the U.S. Mafia due to his partnership with other immigrant groups in New York City. Without New York City being an immigrant city, this would not have been possible. While the community of the Lower East Side would remain the cultural center of the Jewish immigration from Russia, other Jewish communities began sprouting up throughout New York City. Harlem's Little Russia evolved in the first decades of the 20th century, with Jews populating streets alongside German immigrants and African Americans who were mostly located above 135th Street. The underdeveloped Bronx, with tree-lined avenues and vacant lots, became home to large Jewish communities as well. With the construction of the Williamsburg 
Hungary Bridge in 1903, the Jews of the Lower East Side literally walked across the bridge and entered into Williamsburg, which became a community with a large population of Eastern European Jews. My maternal grandparents actually met on the Williamsburg Bridge. Most, but not all, of these Jews sought to maintain their identity, but still fit into U.S. society. New forms of Judaism, like Reform Judaism and Reconstructionism, allowed them to do so. Among Jews, education was seen as the best way to make it in the United States. New York City's public schools served as an avenue to middle-class America for many Jewish immigrants. By 1905, 70% of the public school children in New York City were born outside of the country. More Jews above the age of 16 were going to school than any other ethnic group in New York City. Male education was emphasized. Daughters represented about 40% of Jewish families' income. This allowed their brothers to fill the ranks of Hunter and City College, which were 44% and 73% Jewish, respectively. To prevent Jewish dominance at the nation's elite schools, many instituted a Jewish quota system, making sure only a certain number of Jews could come in each year. My grandmother, Caroline, got into Smith College in the 1930s before receiving a letter that said, Sorry, we already have seven Jews coming for this class. Your acceptance is rescinded. Jews were not alone in this regard. Catholics and blacks also faced quota systems at institutions of higher learning. Still, Jews found a way into mainstream society. Many Jewish immigrants celebrated Christmas because it was seen as the American thing to do. It may seem odd, but Jews also wrote Christmas songs, including Dreaming of a White Christmas and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. While many Jews were blending into U.S. society by the early 1930s, the rise of Hitler and the Nazis reminded them of their Jewish identity. Nazism and Hitler were not just a foreign threat. Fascism was very popular in the United States among whites, looking for an explanation for their own suffering during the Great Depression. As the Nazis began passing anti-Jewish laws that undermined the social and economic rights of German Jews, most Americans said the Jews were at least partially responsible. Jews in the U.S. protested Hitler, but many said nothing because they didn't want to stir up trouble in a country that considered Jews somewhat to blame for their own misery. We have to remember that after the Johnston Reed Act of 1924, it was very difficult for many Jews to get into the United States. With this law in place, Franklin Roosevelt and the State Department did not allow Jews in as refugees during the Holocaust. Many Jews, including the refugees of the MS St. Louis, were rejected when they tried to flee Nazi Germany. A State Department official telegraphed the passengers, telling them that they must await their turns on the waiting list and obtain immigration visas before they may be admissible into the United States. In the words of Mark Twain, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. The passengers of the St. Louis were sent back to Europe. 254 of them died in the Holocaust. While it was too late for the millions who died in the Holocaust, both Jew and non-Jew, after the war, over 100,000 survivors of the Holocaust immigrated to the United States. These more recent immigrants have become a part of the 1.7 million Jews who live in New York City and the metro area today. This event led to widespread sadness. This event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe as many this event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe as this event led to widespread sadness this event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe as many this event led to widespread sadness across Eastern this event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe okay I'm gonna take you down oh this event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe. This event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe. This event led to widespread sadness across East. This event led to widespread sadness across East. This event led to widespread sadness across Eastern Europe, as many assumed. 